Let's uh, read our passage for this morning. It's Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. It's on the screen, but I encourage you to use a Bible if you have one and put your finger right into the text. 1, 15 to 20. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by all, him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will have come to have preeminence in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You remember that yesterday we concluded by remarking on the relationship between Christ and the soul that is freed to sing, a la our dear brother Sam Shu, the soul that is freed to sing. Now that has double significance for today and that this passage that we are focusing on this morning is commonly known in biblical scholarly circles as the Christ hymn. The evidence that this was in fact what we could call musical theology is clear in the form of a hymn is plain enough. Paramount being the sequence of clauses and phrases that fall easily into matching rhythmic units such as might be afforded in the combination of poetic arts and musical arts. Secondly, the appearance of various terms, particularly visible, Thrones, hold together, beginning, preeminence, making peace, the blood of the cross, all of which are not found elsewhere, anywhere in Paul's, the Apostle Paul's language. Thus suggesting what pre-existed amongst the earliest Christians of what I call musical theology in the form of theologically potent hymns. The third quite obvious reason for understanding this passage as the Christ hymn is the very clear structure of two strophes or verses, just like in a hymn marked by paralleling of key motifs. And we will come back to these two strophes or two verses of this Christ hymn as the basis of what I really want to get to to say to you in terms of the application of this hymn, the Christ hymn to you and me. But first, two important preliminary things to say about the passage by way of critical and I think crucial observations. First, that Christians at such an early stage should be willing and also able to use such lofty and cogent language in extolling Jesus Christ tells us much about the intellectual vitality of the first Christian communities, although they were so poor, we know that. They were vitally, intellectually engaged people. It reminds us, as John Stott used to say, that the in the Christian life, the mind matters. Do you believe that? In the Christian life, the mind actually matters. This grand theological hymn is itself a sharp reminder that there were front rank thinkers among the first Christians, eager to engage with their contemporaries in an attempt to grapple with and to some, time, and to some extent explain reality. And I think this is equally necessary, not just in the academic world, but in the arts, especially and similarly for today. Let the church, let Chehi Summer School of Music raise up front rank practitioners 
in all the arts. It reminds me of an astounding piece of news, which was the talk of Europe for a few weeks, that came out in the Guardian newspaper in London a number of years ago. It was the story of a long lost painting by the Italian Renaissance painter Michelangelo da Caravaggio, recently discovered by accident. There it is, I'm sorry for its kind of gruesome, <laughs> gruesome story behind it. It's titled Judith Beheading Holofernes, Holofernes. From the story in the book of Judith, one of the Deut deuterocanonical books in Jewish sacred writings. Painted, most believe, in the year 1598, with many, many renditions and early versions suggesting that Caravaggio strove for perfection in this piece. But the final perfected version went lost for 418 years and was recently only found by accident when the owners of a house near Toulouse, France, went to fix a leak up in their ceiling and they found this painting stuck in amongst the rafters. The painting measures 56 inches by 69, thus quite a large painting, and it's now worth, any guesses how much it's worth? 18.4 million. Getting close. 140 million dollars. So it reminds me that front rank artistry is still highly valued. And so like the Colossian Christians, we need not only front rank thinkers, but also front rank practitioners in all of the arts and especially here as we focus on musical arts. Young men and women studying here at Chehi Summer School of Music, this grand Christ hymn urges you to aspire to front rank musical contributions for the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ. Second preliminary observation is this. You will note that this hymn is not, this is so important, this is not addressed to Christ, but this is in praise of Christ. And that says something very important to me and I think to really all of us. Of course, worship should include addressing Christ in the mode of petition, seeking his intervening power, in terms of accolades expressing our love for him. But this is often, in my experience, overbalanced and easily degenerates into overly sentimentalized gush <laughs> and the reducing of Jesus to one to whom we turn simply in case of emergency. But the mode of worship that is more about in praise of Christ is like we see here and perhaps is more than just a corrective balance but is actually a more accurate Christology, that study of who Jesus is offering descriptor after descriptor, extolling and acclaiming and acknowledging who this Christ really is in the universe, in the world, in our lives, in the broad plan of God. And so now let's turn to the two verses of this hymn, the two strophes, and see how they both challenge and help us today. Strophe one of this grand hymn to Christ runs from verses 15 through the first half of verse 18. Let's look at it now. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. Now, there is so much in all of this. But because of our time restraints so that you can go to rehearsals and lessons and all that, I will just pick out a few things in this first strophe that I think are most important for you and me in our lives and in our world right now today. We start off with the very first line of this Christ hymn. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. What does it mean to us that Jesus Christ is the image of something that is invisible, namely God? It is the term icon. Hos estin icon, which was part of a group of terms in the New Testament vernacular, which were trying to convey ways of speaking of God's own outreach to an interaction with his world and his people whom he loves, his creation. Ways, in other words, of speaking of God's imminence, his closeness to us, while safeguarding his transcendence, his total otherness than us, from us. In other words, it is trying to get at the closest personification of God himself. Young women, young men, everything that can be known about God according to the Bible, God who is invisible is made visible to you and to the whole world and all of creation in Jesus Christ. If you want to know who God is, according to this passage, look at Jesus. He is the image, the icon of the invisible God. Some of you are here this summer, and I know even from talking with you and talking with some of your counselors, you're wrestling with, who is this Jesus? I urge you to seek that out, search that out, study that. Talk with counselors, faculty, me if you want. To be certain. All that you want to know about God according to the Bible. And in my experience you will find as you get to know Jesus Christ. Which is why we praise him in a Christ hymn like this. Another thing I would note is highly significant in this first strophe is what we come to in verse 17. In him all things hold together. It has been argued that this is particularly and solely dealing with cosmological dimensions. Uh, Platonic, stoic cosmology in other words that are actually hinged upon Christ who is like a cosmic glue. But that flies in the face of what James Dunn, one of the premier New Testament scholars of this century, refers to as the poetic imagination that is clearly allowed for in the liberality of him theology, him poetics, musical theology, so that it is also meant to address not just the cosmos, but even our own personal contexts and situations. As we can draw exegetically from the emphasis in this text on that word all. Do you see that in the passage? All. Panta. In him all things hold together. Kai, tai, panta, and auto sunesteken. They hold together. That all includes not just the cosmos, not just world structures, although that's so important, but also you. Your world. Your relationships. 
your dreams, your emotions, even your successes and your failures. When you focus yourself on Jesus Christ, all the elements and vagaries of your life find cohesion, coherence, and congruence. Not easiness, but ultimate congruence. Which is why we praise him in such a Christ hymn like this. And so we move to strophe two that we read in verses 18b, the second half of verse 18 through verse 20. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have preeminence in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And here as well, because of our time constraints, I will just note a couple of very important Christ truths. Verse 19 affirms that Jesus Christ is defined as the one in whom all fullness dwells. Pan to pleroma, all the fullness in the Bible speaks of the fullness of God, fullness of human potential, and thus meaning ultimately suggesting the fullness of real meaning. Pleroma in New Testament, fullness in New Testament idiomatic usage has to do with understanding that instigates meaning. In the Bible, the goal is not just understanding, but understanding that promotes, instigates, inspires in your life. This is meaningful, which is why music is so important, isn't it? It brings depth of meaning. Young men, young women, complete and real meaning. I promise you, by the word of God and also my experience and many others here, complete and real meaning is found in none other than Jesus Christ. Some of you, again, are here this summer and you're struggling with what does it all mean? What is the meaning of my life? You will find that as you focus on this incredible Christ him person, Jesus himself. So be cautious, be warned, I would even say, about seeking meaning for your life elsewhere. Some of you will be tempted to seek meaning in early sexual exploration, and I encourage you, seek meaning in Jesus. Some of you will be in tempted to seek meaning and accolades and success and all sorts of other lifestyle choices. I think it is safe to say on the basis of the Bible that all other promises of meaning will let you down and leave you disappointed and broken and hurt. But not Jesus. All the fullness of God is in him, all that brings meaning, pleroma. And further, the little word, the conjunction and in this passage in verse 20, ties, doesn't it, the reality of meaning directly to an historical event that we reverently humbly referred to as the cross of Christ and through him to reconcile all things. 
to himself, having made peace, shalom, through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. This grand Christ hymn declares without reserve at all that the cross of Jesus is both the source and the measure of meaning for the world and for you and your context, your life. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Every single place in the New Testament where the word peace shows up, it is a rene, it is translating the Hebrew word shalom. The reality of shalom, God's overarching goal for all of his creation of well-being, healthy relationships, forgiveness with a holy God, completeness, experiential joy, real fullness of meaning, shalom, peace, because of the verifiable work of Christ on the cross. I am sure some students, some staff, some faculty even are here today and you are wrestling with where does shalom in this world? Where is this overarching peace that God promises through the Isaiah, the prophets call, there is a prince of shalom, a prince of peace. Colossians reminds us it comes through Jesus and his work on the cross to reconcile all things. As we conclude, you will notice, however, that I skipped over what is probably grammatically the most important part of this hymn to Christ. This is where it all comes together. Grammatically, exegetically, we cannot do justice to this passage without giving primary attention as we conclude in a few minutes to the most important part of this hymn to Christ. For there is only one place where the objective of it all, the objective of all this praise of Christ is offered. And that is the one so that statement. You see it in the passage? It's called a hinna clause, also translated in order that, that we find at the end of verse 18. So that hinna, he himself will come to have preeminence, supremacy, first place in everything. Protuan. Preeminence. I'd like you to learn that one New Testament original language word, protuon. Just mouth it throughout today, meaning preeminent position, first and foremost in everything and in every way, surpassing all else, belongs to Jesus Christ. It begs the question then, doesn't it? It begs the question out of you and me in honesty today. It suggests that we cannot read this as simply grand and theologically sound hymnody. But it is a hymn that levels a question to any who dare to sing this hymn. Is Jesus Christ preeminent in your life? Is Jesus Christ first and foremost in everything and every way? Is he surpassing all others? Does he take first place? not only in the cosmos of God, not only in the overarching shalom purpose of God, but in your life as an individual person, part of this Chehi community this week, is Jesus Christ preeminent? 
And that leads me to conclude, as I promised, with a quote today, for today coming from dear Uncle Wilmus, Wilmus Chehi, the founder of our beloved Chehi Summer School. We always refer to him as Uncle Wilmus. And it was at a faculty meeting at the end of a full day of Chehi Summer School of Music activities, you know how it is at the end of a day. We were discussing the hymn, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run, his kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Jesus shall reign which we had just sung a few minutes earlier at the sing time with the whole of the students. And this is what Wilmus Chehi said that so struck me as I wrote it down in my card dated 1983. Wilmus Chehi said, I want our students to become the best musicians they can possibly become. But even more than that, I want Jesus to reign in their lives, whatever they do. Is Jesus first place? Does Jesus reign in your life today? Lord God, I thank you for these beloved students. They so impress me. I really am honestly honored to be part of your work in their lives. These dear staff, all these people in the kitchen, our counselors and the amazing hours they give and their passion for Christ and these teachers who poured into the students. I pray that in all of it, we would seek to be front rank contributors, practitioners in the fine arts. But like Wilmus J, he said, more than that, I hope that Jesus Christ will reign in them. We pray for that today in the powerful name of this Jesus of the Christ hymn. Amen. <laughs>